Hello. Today I am inviting. Oops. Or I'm not. Jane Shulak. Waving. Okay, I'm gonna give her a minute. Hi, how are you doing? I am in the Finger Lakes and it is beautiful. I don't know if you can tell. I don't think you can. Ah, it's a little cast, but the Finger Lakes are so beautiful. Oh no, Jane is unable to join. I will try her again. Okay, now it's working. All right, I'm on. Goodbye. Alexa? Hi. Hi. I'm sorry. I was calling uh, for help. <laughs> Video help. And uh, well, I... here you are. It all worked. Yes. So nice to see you. Thank nice you. Nice to see you. And congratulations on the new book. Thank you. We are very, very proud. I kind of feel like we gave birth. Um, and I've had a bunch of people say, so when's the next book? And I feel like it's like when you have your first child. The minute you have the first child, people say, when are you having the next child? And yeah, and it's probably as well received as it is for a woman who has just given birth. Right. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> I think no, thank I you. So, <laughs> tell which will we'll all lead up to the book. Wait, I'm sorry. I missed you there. I'm moving to see if I get better reception. Okay. What did you just say? I said, give me a walkthrough of your history and how it, we, we will end at the book. Okay, my history. Um, well, I'm a little bit of a late bloomer. Mm -hmm. I think my design history started with David Hicks. Years ago, my husband uh, did a lot of traveling. We practically lived in London and I inserted myself into David Hicks's life, who I don't know if you're familiar, you know who he was. Yes, is. My father's, um, my father's first job was for David. That's right. I kind of remember reading that actually. So I really, and it's a funny story, but I won't get into it now. Um, but I, I really well, did funny, put do myself into his life. Well, I'll, anyways, I, I called him, we were on a business trip, my husband and I, and I kind of made up a story and said that I, I knew someone that, I don't know, it was a crazy thing. Anyways, he was so warm and wonderful that he ended up inviting me to lunch. And I went to lunch with, at, in Oxfordshire with him and Lady Pamela, his wife, mm -hmm. um, had a brilliant time and ended up becoming really great friends and doing a lot of work together until he passed away. Um, he came into my life about... I'd say it's about four years before he died, four or five years, and did mm -hmm. some garden work at my house, some design work, but also I traveled with him and visited many jobs and really learned a lot. Right before David died, I said to him, you know, what am I going to do without you? I was crazy about him, and he was really like my first teacher. I lost you. I lost your audio. Did you by chance press? Can anybody? Oh, there you are. Good, 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 good. Was somebody calling yeah. you maybe? So right before David passed away, um, he introduced me to two people who then I started to work with, Christian Baden from Paris and Barbara Worth. And that became a huge 
relationship that lasted about 18 years for me, where I was in and out of Paris. They definitely helped me work on my house, but also really taught me to teach, to speak a language that I was always meant to speak, but didn't really have the words. Um, from them, I got very deeply passionate, of, you know, interested into the decorative arts, joined the Museum of Decorative Arts in Paris, started to work for them and designed tables and worked within different departments, coming up with um, tabletops as a way to raise money for the museum and working with the objects that are the very old objects and translating them into the 21st century, which is something I can talk about. What? Alexa? Yes, can you hear me? Can Hello? you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. Okay. Um, and Were then, you, and did you grow up in a family that entertained a lot? I mean, did, did some of the seeds of this start early or this was, as you said about late blooming, yes. was it something you started to increasingly care about and just, to just look around well, and say, well, I want to be surrounded girl, everywhere. Yeah, ever since, well, I definitely grew up in a beautiful house and my mother was, is, is an avid gardener. So none of this is new to me. Um, but ever since I was a little girl, I didn't realize that this is that I was so interested in design. But I used to walk around when I visited my grandma and knock on people's doors when I was like nine and say things <laughs> like, I'm new in town and I'm going to be a designer. Can you show me your living room? And, you know, all these silly things that I didn't realize. And I actually didn't even go to college wow. to be a designer. But it came to me later. Um, so, yes, I mean, I've been surrounded by good design gardens and deeply interested, but never really pursued until much later in my life. Right. Um, then, it's a you great know, late career. I mean, it is a wonderful thing for people who, who like you do not heed the call immediately. It's right. still there waiting. Well, out of it, out of my experiences in Europe and working at the museum and working with these really incredible, Jane, I lost you again. Uh-oh. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, yeah. Okay. So, you know, it was, it was an amazing experience, and it gave me a big window into what was possible that I didn't, that I had no idea that I could even, what my range would be, and a, a serious education beyond picking chairs, which is also really wonderful. But, um, of course by the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when you were doing, when, when you started working, um, was this all through the, the it, through philanthropy? Were you taking private well, commissions? Was it, what were you doing? No, no, no. So I had two things that I did a lot before, well, one more than the other before the book. One was the work that I've done at the Museum of Decorative Arts in Paris, which is not huge, but I designed uh, three different lunches for them. Mm -hmm. Picked a department, found old objects, found new artists that were inspired by those objects, and then designed a room that we could, in, you know, invite people into as a way to raise money, which was really interesting and really fun. Um, the other thing that I've been doing for 10 years is a thing called Culture Lab Detroit, where I developed a platform for arts and culture in Detroit. And that's been fascinating. And in an odd way, the layering of history, the talking about ideas through arts and culture and decorative arts and craft has been, is all, it kind of fits into everything else that I've been doing. Um, David and I met because uh, he did a wedding for my daughter our daughter wow. and we um became and like, now we're friends stark. david stark yes yeah. so, so, so we david. met because he did this wedding for my daughter i found him and i knew the minute that i met him that i would love him and that he was an artist and i was always i was looking for a collaborator i didn't even realize how much i was looking for a collaborator i mean i had met some great people but it wasn't 
the same. It was more about just pay them, they'll do the wedding. Right. And this became more of an art making experience and a collaboration, which is something that I needed and always look for. Um, and and then, you were already doing the lab. Well, I was just getting started. Actually. Because what what I've read about it and about you know, the, the, the discussions you're having with artists and, you know, digging deep the process, working together, artisanship, like all, I'm sure it would inspire you then collaboration more. Right. Then I, I mean, to your point, if you're not, you're not just, you're not just hiring somebody. Right. No. Yeah. It's much more complicated than that. It's, um, discovering a topic that feels relevant and important and of the moment in a place in a city like Detroit. And then how do we have a conversation about that topic, but also have an outcome, you know, something that is in continuum, that it isn't just that we had this conversation and we talked about it, but did we make something together? Do we break bread together? Do we create an opportunity for some of the folks that, that attended to actually reach out to the uh, person that was speaking or the groups of people that were speaking and how do you do that? And it's still actually, it's, um, you know, it changes constantly how, how we do that, especially after COVID and we can't meet in quite the same way. Uh -huh. But, um, but they're always, all of my conversations or artwork or creative direction or whatever it is that I do is always centered on arts and culture and the layering and the historical layers, which are really interesting to me. It's sort of like 18th century meets mid-century meets 21st century. Mm -hmm. And we did that all throughout the book. And my own work is kind of always about that too. Okay, so when you got started, um, what was your first conversation about that? Wait, I'm sorry, I missed it. when I when I first what decided to write the book with Dave. What was that first conversation like? Well, I think there were many conversations before <laughs> the first conversation about the book because David and I, by the time we started to work on the book, we had already made things together for a number of years. David. Um, right after I met him and he did the wedding and we, there was like a synergy energy between us. A couple months later, he literally plopped his floor plans on my lap and said, okay, you'll be the designer. And he had, he had a great architect too, who we love very much, but I became suddenly David Stark designer uh, for his house, not for his job. That's Thing. So, so we did that. Um, and then I got him back because I said to him, okay, you're going to help me build culture lab. And he really, uh, David was amazing because what David really taught me to do, and he does so well, is he's able to take a creative idea and give it a framework, give it, it's not just an idea, but make it in his for him and turn it into a whole huge international business but for me it was tremendously helpful and such a learning experience to understand that you can't just have an idea you can't just put a bunch of people in a room but it actually has to become something and it has to work and there are a lot of benchmarks in in how to get there and he also participated he designed for culture lab and was a you know, worked on many different ways. So David and I, up until the book, had we have a very unique relationship. I have worked for him. He has worked for me. We have worked together. And we have tossed it all out of the window and just been really great friends. Okay. So we're able to kind of morph into. So by the time we got to the book, I had been, you know, David's done many books. I've never done a book before. Um, but I had been introducing him, talking to him about traveling with him, showing him things, and just sort of slowly saying, I think we need to do this thing. Uh -huh. um, 
And I don't remember the exact first conversation, but it, like after a few years, it kind of became our conversation. Like, what if we did this together? What if it looked like this? How would we do it? And, you know, the other thing is that we have very different strengths and weaknesses, which I think is really good. Um, and we knowingly and openly support each other's strengths and weaknesses. And together, we made a book. <laughs> so, it, so, you know. so what are your strengths? What are his strengths, as you see? Well, I think that I have... How do you divvy it up? Um... I have, a, I have a different kind of design training than David. It's less formalized in a way because I didn't, you know, get a master's and go to, I did go to college. I got a degree in art, but it's nothing like what, what I do now. Um, my training is more on the street and experiences and the people that I've worked with and the company I've been in, the, play, the things that I've seen. Um, and just having made things for so many years for myself, for David, for other, and for a few other people, and for the museum and for Detroit. So it's a different kind of training. Um, I have a huge sort of resource library in my head of where to go. Um, David, so that's, I think that's one of my strengths, mm -hmm. actually. Um, I think, and one of my obvious weaknesses is that. I had never made a book before. I'm not as comfortable. I had to, it was a real learning curve for me to understand what the camera sees and what my eye sees, mm -hmm. which is a whole thing and how to put it together. And David has an excellent way of distilling all the information. So often I brought a zillion things to the table and said, okay, this is our black chapter. This is what we're going to do. I see 11 different shades of black. I want these different mirrors. I want these chairs. I want these dishes. What do you think? You know, where do you want to go with it? And I'm going to use this wedge, these Wedgwood pieces. How do we do this? And he, one of his strengths is he's able to say to me, all right, this is all good, but that's too much, Jane. Like we, we work very well together that way. Yeah, and we're not, and it's all in the spirit of getting the job done properly. So there isn't a negative, you know, there's no, no hard feelings if, if he says to me, nope, that's the wrong, that's the wrong spot. Um, I don't think that da you're asking me what's David's negative. I don't think that he has a negative. I'm not going to say anything negative about David Stark, my partner. Well, only, uh, only each other's strengths and how you balance Yeah, them. yeah. I mean, those are his strengths and they've been huge. Um, you know, he has, he's real busy. He has a million jobs, so he can't, um, some of the, the hiding, the looking, the seeking and the hunting was a lot left up to me, but I'm a very good hunter, huntress. And, <laughs> um, I do that. Um, and I just, I think we teach each other and we feed each other really well. I've never had a relationship that's this versatile in my life with a person that I work with, you know, um, have fun with, work for, him work for me. You know, we, we've just turned it into so many things. Um, I mean, so, I designed his office too. Of, of the things that you guys made together, when did you, when did you start making things? What were your first well, we started making things right. Well, we started making things together without even realizing it. I think at my daughter's wedding, mm -hmm. it became more than a job. I mean, it was a job and it was a great job. And he, you know, was happy to do the job. And I was excited to have him to do the job. But I didn't, I don't think either one of us realized how far we could push each other. And it became, it was really gloriously beautiful. It's on the cover of his last solo book. Um, and we really... I mean, they, obviously, David Start what? What's his last book called that on the cover of? I can't remember. Is it David Stark Designs? Or he'll probably kill me if he's listening no. to this. But I can't remember. But I can't remember. But it has the wedding on the cover. Okay. It's got a Porto flowered cloth. And it's at, actually at my house. Um, so it was, you know, I don't think either one of us realized how magical and how profound our relationship would become. And that we had this 
need to collaborate. I've always collaborated anyways in every, all my work is a collaboration, but, um, and so the, and the wedding, you know, we fed each other. Like he would ask a question, I'd feed an answer. I'd say, well, I think I want this. And it just became, I mean, obviously they did all the work, but it was, <laughs> you know, we know that, but it was, it was a, a really interesting, wonderful design relationship. And that's what led, I think, probably him. I mean, I said to him, you want me to be your designer? Like, that's a risk. Um, but, you know, it worked out. I'm really proud of his house, and I think he is too. And it's yeah. great. And I listen to him. You know, I'm a good designer when I'm working for someone. I do what they want. So, you know. Crazy that he just came. Like, okay, here, you do this. You do this for me. I know, and he did it with his office too, which is like 30,000 square feet. I said, you can't be serious, I'm doing this. But it was good. I had a budget, I did it, I am very proud of it. I think they, are, they like it a lot and you know. But I put him to the, t I've had him work for me hard for Culture Lab, so. What about Culture Lab? Because it's really interesting what you're doing. Sorry, I'm walking around because I'm not sure. Okay. So tell me about Culture um, What year did you found it? Um, you know, I think it was 2013. I think if I look back, it was about 2013-ish that I founded it. And you know, the thing about Culture Lab is that I had an idea of what I was doing, but I very much low-browed it because I wasn't sure what it would be or what it could be or what it needed to be. And something crazy happened. The lights went out. There was a thunderstorm on the first conversation. And I got a school to uh, pay to have us have the conversation. What is the mission statement of the Culture Lab? It's to bring, oh my God, Alexa. I don't have it in front of me. <laughs> they need to know what we're talking about. It's to what? bring, Culture Lab Detroit is a platform that is all about identifying a conversation in Detroit, an arts and culture conversation, and um, taking that conversation and connecting to the, the dots within Detroit nationally and internationally, and choosing topics that make sense and it creating, you know, collaborations globally. Give me, give me some, give me some examples of research that you've done. For before. instance, well, before COVID, um, we had one, well, we've had many, but we had a conversation called, we worked with a writer named Hilton Alls, and we had a conversation called Post Truth. Mm -hmm. And we had Mel Chin was one of our artists. We had, we featured Detroit artists uh, making things. We, um, Hilton Alls was our moderator. D oh, no, Dina Hagag was the moderator from United States Artists. Hilton, Hilton was, but he talks so much and he's so smart. Um, Hilton was on the panel and um, another person I can't remember. But we, we identified major topics. So we've had post-truth. We've had beauty. We've had the politics and possibilities of green space. We've had architecture, conversa urban architecture, and holding space. Um, what does design look like in Detroit? We've had design collaborations where we worked with, for instance, the Campana Brothers and uh -huh. paired them with a Detroit artist and together made objects and sold them where both artists' names are at the, on the piece. Worked with Paola Devone, that time worked with David Stark, who designed uh -huh. beautifully, always. Um, and so it's a very intellectual conversation, but at the same time, it well, is we have workshops, and then we have we have meals, and we have gatherings where the community gathers, and we break bread. And in fact, now I'm working on a series of workshops where we actually bake our own bread, make our own chair, and make our own plates, because I feel like we need to be much more intimate with the tools like food, shelter, and clothing mm -hmm. that we all kind of thrive, survive, need. Um, and so it's gonna have a very different flavor as yeah. I go forward. Um, do you, I mean, I can't even imagine, do you, does the public come in and see, I mean, uh, see all of this output, all the artistic output? Yeah people participating in the culture lab do you exhibit yeah, we do we always have part of it is sort of an artifact moment 
where we show things, whether we've documented, so we have photographs of our process or, um, you know, actually have things that you can buy that are in your hands or, but we do invite the public in. Um, so and this really refers back to your time at the Museum of Decorative Arts in Paris, do you? The, the object starts the thinking. Yeah, the object starts the thinking. I'm really interested in everyday craft and how it affects our lives and then, and the utilitarian, you know, desire, need, but also the beauty, I think beauty. And I'm seriously, you know, one of the chapters in our book, and I thought this was really interesting. So one of the chapters in our book, the last chapter is called Social Threads. And we decided because of COVID, we shot the, the last part of our book in Detroit. And it became an even more profound conversation because the place became part of, um, the conversation it became sort of part of the or part of part of the table the social history of the place so we chose to shoot that last chapter at a place called the african bead museum which is a magnificent example of um taking over a space in detroit creating a museum covering it in well this this man olami dabbles who has literally just took over the space years ago, um, has covered it in all kinds of images that relate to his African culture, to his life experience, and it's staggeringly beautiful. And, and in the book, we write about what it, what it means and what it is. And we placed, we worked with a woman named Loretta Bennett, who's part mm -hmm. of G's Band Alabama to do our tablecloths. Originally we thought, or our quilts that would became tablecloths. Originally I thought we would do like Marie Antoinette's a fragment and do a whole thing, which I could get from the Museum of Decorative Arts. But then I thought, no, let's take this story to something that we're all feeling right now. Mm -hmm. So found Loretta Bennett, took this information to Dobbles, to the African Bee Museum. And I said to him, I'm having a crazy idea, if you agree. Um, I, I, I know that you're gonna love the idea that Loretta is doing the tablecloths, but I'm having an idea about who and what I think should be on the table. And I wanna to talk to you about material culture because I, don't want you, I didn't want him to be offended. Um, and he said, or really, he taught me a lot. So I, he said, well, what do you wanna do? I said, well, I kinda of wanna have 18th century Portuguese silver on the table and then a little Venetian glass. And I also wanted him to make something so that he would be a part of it too. And I said, but is that gonna be troubling for, you, for where you're coming from and what this place is all about? He said, no, I love it. He said, material culture is the one thing that we can all celebrate and that we can all agree upon and the importance of beauty and the importance that we can share that. And let's keep that out of the conversation and why don't you put those 18th century silver Portuguese plates on a table in front of my building and be proud of it? So that was that was great. Yeah. So 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 a lot of what the what what you seem to be most interested in is um, in addition to celebrating beautiful things or being inspired by beautiful things, also advocating for the story. Yes. Behind. Yes, for the story. And, and as a designer, you know, one of your questions were, um, do you, you know, what period? I, I like all periods. I mean, when I design and when I work, it's, I get something, there's so much there in so many different periods. What I wouldn't do is have a period room. Uh -huh. that, that would be hard for me because I have too big of a range. Yeah, and there's beautiful things. Yeah. Well, or meaningful. You know, yes. a room has a single message to give. Um, and that is, doesn't totally feel appropriate anymore or authentic or. Right. You know, and you're, you're trying to be um, lots of living artisans. Yes. yes. Right? Not all 19th century or 18th century. It's, these are people. Well, I like some of the 18th century uh, furniture makers. <laughs> they were pretty fabulous. Me too. We love them. 19th and 19th. 
absolutely love them. But yes, no, I'm very, very interested in craft and makers right now. Um, Another one of our people in our book that we worked with is Roberto Lugo, who was fabulous. And his dishes, I mean, they're all, every, every person, every place is steeped in history, but his dishes are so interesting because they're so, that's from our royalty chapter, they're so layered. And if you look at, I'm also really interested in textiles and pattern. Uh-huh. And so if you look at his dishes, I mean, he's got like Coptic Egyptian patterns layered on top of African patterns, on top of images and colors. And I, I you know, I just think it's fascinating. But totally. So, what is um, you know the art of the table and and, and sharing community time or family time is um, has such contrast because part of it is totally temporary. You're sitting down, right? Where, you know, it's very deep and meaningful and permanent on one hand, but then it's you know you pick things up and clear the table on the other. Um, how did this, um, you know, your, your, the thing that spoke to you? Well, you know, everything we do is fleeting. Mm-hmm. Like, but um, I just think it's so, it sort of like marks your time on earth. It's so, such a civilized move to sit at a table, whether you share, you know, to share a meal, to drink a glass of wine, to talk to somebody, to make it beautiful, to celebrate that moment. I mean, all moments are momentary. <laughs> like it's no- nothing really lasts. You know, another thing, and this is kind of an interesting thing. So when I got started with the book, I re- did a lot of reading on um, manners and and table, like like forks, that when did it become a three-pronged fork and not a thing that stabs you in your tongue, right. which I do have some of those because they're so beautiful, but, uh, and I do use them on occasion, but they're not, they're not easy. Anyways, and I started to, I did a lot of reading and I came across a really interesting thing. So there was a Harvard professor, um, oh God, I'm forgetting his name, but he recently wrote a book and is someone pinchered, or I forget, anyways, he said that one of the things that happened when etiquette came about in like the 15th century is that he believed, and he actually even listed what was proper etiquette, which you would die Mm -hmm. if you heard, what you were and were not allowed to do at the table, but that he thinks that when people sat down together, I mean, this, that, that that was a distinct moment in civilization when they started to talk about killing before they actually went out and killed, that the, that they started to talk about territory before they actually went out and claimed it, that it became a civil, like a civilized moment, like we're going to sit down and we're going to look at each other. And he thinks that it influenced history, that there were certain things that were required of you if you were going to sit down at a table, like, for instance, he says, you can't throw up on the table. I mean, they're horrible things, <laughs> like you wouldn't think of doing. And I won't even repeat some of the other things, but there's this long list of what we do and do not do at a table in the 15th century. So it's kind of fascinating. So the whole idea, and if you think about like- Where it becomes an event. Yeah, event. But, and also the most famous paintings, you know, the paintings yeah. at the Leonardo at the table. Like it's, you know, it's, I think that, and I'm probably not even the right one to get even deeper because I'm not an art historian, but like the table. Or, or religious. Yeah, or religious either. So, but it's, it's kind of the thing that brings us together. And for me and for David, I mean, we just love celebrating the beauty and the art of the table, so. How, how hard did it hit during COVID have its absence? Um, well, it was okay because actually I live just outside of Detroit. And we, I, I knew such amazing places where we could shoot. So it no, actually- I to sit down and with- Oh, friends, to sit down. <laughs> with, with people in the lab and the very things that you're celebrating. Oh, well, we didn't, were, I didn't were, do it. We did, we just closed down. I mean, the whole world just kind of took a breather. Yeah. And I guess we all had permission to breathe a little bit. Now I'm running around. I keep saying to myself, oh my God, I sort of miss that quiet. 
Yeah. And that moment of being able to sort through what am I going to do? What aren't I going to do? And, you know, but all the things that you, you say it was what table life then, you know, became. Yes. It's sitting down yeah. and just saying, what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? Yeah. Yeah. And I did have a couple dinner parties during COVID, not a lot, but a few brave friends. We all got together, did things. Um, and I've had a few since, but they've been a little different since. A little more careful how many people and- Is that, really, is that still the case? Yeah, I'm a little bit careful. I don't think people want to come to like a 25 person dinner table, dinner party inside my house mm -hmm. is easily, you know, I'd have dinner party after dinner party in my kitchen, like cram 25 people in at a big long table and be mm -hmm. sitting so tight and screaming and yelling and talking and laughing and eating and drinking. But you can't, I don't know if anybody would show up if I attempted that now, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, how do, how do the makers who you celebrate at the lab feel about, like how, how their lives have changed? Well, I work a lot with um, community uh, leaders and mm -hmm. artists and advocates and, um, or activists, I should say. Um, they are, you know, Detroit is complicated. There's a lot of issues. They, they need Wi-Fi. I mean, there's a lot of issues. So there, we're constantly trying to come up with ways through arts and culture to talk about these policy and pol political issues. And that's a difficult thing to do. Yeah. It's, about, it's, you know, it's, to do it right. It's heavy and important. Yeah, exactly. Well, so. well I think that is, uh, it, it's a great thing that you're tackling heavy and important at the same time that you're celebrating the beautiful and well, the thank celebratory. You, thank you. Uh, it, where, do you, tell me about the name of the book again, or for the first time. Oh, the book is, wait, what's the title of the book? Yes. It, the title is at the, I'm sorry, you're coming in and out. The title is At the Artisan's Table. At the Artisan's Table, and you can go to At the Artisan's Table. And it's a Von uh -huh. Dome book. And if you go Amazon, Jane Shulak, or David Stark book, um, at the, it'll come right up. It should come right up. And we hope everybody rushes out and buys it. Uh, well, buys definitely. Many copies. Many, many. And um, how can we participate in the, the Detroit culture life? Um, that's so interesting. Oh, you're, I love that. Well, you know what? I'll just be in contact with you and let you know, because maybe there'll be some of these conversations where you can actually, we'll go live with them. We're also building a digital platform because there isn't an arts and culture digital platform in Detroit, believe it or not. Um, that's something that where there's an editor and where we're talking about, you know, current issues and also using a lot of the, putting out a lot of the material that we do have anyway, that we have in the past, because we've, you know, got a lot on YouTube and have uh, photographs and we have a ton of documentation from all of the years. So maybe that would be an, a good thing and you would actually feed it to the world as yeah. we go along, but we can stay in contact. Yes, please. Uh, and we can, all, we can all follow you and you will let us know. I'm just getting used to being on Instagram. I had a secret name because I didn't think I wanted anybody to know who I was. Yeah. And that, that lasted yeah. five minutes. And then I changed. And now I, I don't even, I'm just learning how to post. <laughs> I've never, you know, I know we have at the artisan's table, but I personally, I'm just learning how to do it. So I do have my name on Instagram, Jane underscore Shulak. But five minutes ago, I was topiary girl. But Nobody knew who Topiary Girl was, so. And at the artist table, are, it, yes. it's also one of your handles. Yes, yeah, yeah. You can yeah. get to me very easily. All right, thank you so much, Sarah. This, well, thank you so much. I, you're, you're, um, you're just such a, like an energizer bunny. Well, thank you so much, Alexa. And I love what you wrote about me. You wrote the funniest thing at the end. If I, something like, if I was looking for a surgeon, I might call Jane Shulak. I mean, no, you, no, you, <laughs> you do enough things. Well, uh, I don't, you do too. You're an energizer bunny. Thank uh, you. Uh, maybe not. 
Um, thank, you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I will, I know I'm speaking to David soon and I can't wait to okay. uh, the flip side. Great, okay, good luck. Thank you, bye.